bromeliads are a very interesting group of plant. There are many of them that have showy flower structures that last a really long time. Some have incredibly showy foliage, and then there are some that have, have it all. They have the showy flowers and the interesting foliage. There are about 3,500 known species of bromeliads right now, but there are new ones being discovered all the time. All but one species are native to the Western Hemisphere, mostly in Central America and South America. A lot of our cultivated varieties come from Brazil. Well, right here we have quite an array of different types of bromeliads, but I've got two other types right down here that I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Spanish moss, the stuff that grows in the trees down in the southern states, kind of hangs from those large live oaks. It's used a lot in floral and craft projects. It's a bromeliad, believe it or not. All these tiny wiry things are actually pieces of bromeliad plants. Also, would you believe the very tasty and popular pineapple is actually the fruit of a bromeliad plant. The pineapple, when Christopher Columbus was on his second voyage, he discovered the natives there in the West Indies growing the pineapple as a cultivated plant even way back then. Well, he took the plant back to Europe, introduced it to the rest of the world, and about 100 years later, pineapple was being grown throughout the tropical areas of the globe, and still is today. Well, if you've been to Hawaii or maybe some of the other tropical areas, maybe you've seen fields of pineapple. And a lot of our bromeliads, about two-thirds of them, grow in the soil as terrestrial plants, but about one-third, or about the other one-third of all bromeliad species are epiphytes. That means they grow kind of like some of our orchids up in the canopy of the trees. The Spanish moss is a good example of an epiphytic bromeliad. Now, some of the bromeliads that grow in rainforest areas have sort of a cup or a collection space in the center of the plant that collects and holds rainwater. And this collection of water in these bromeliads is very important as it goes to support sort of a mini ecosystem. The water that's held in these bromeliads helps supply just a vast array of wildlife, different snakes, frogs, lizards, possums, insects, and even a few plants survive on the water that's collected in bromeliads. The tropical counterpart of our hummingbirds will drink from the cup or the collection area of bromeliads, and these birds are very important in the pollination of a number of bromeliad species. Now, I want to point out that the bromeliads are not parasitic on the trees like some of our mistletoes and other plants like that. They uh, just attach themselves to the trees, they, they germinate there, they begin to grow there, and it's just the, uh, the niche where they've adapted uh, where they live. Now, they don't derive any of their nutrients or moisture from the tree. They get their moisture from rainfall, or they absorb it from clouds or fogs. Their nutrients they get whenever birds or other animals will uh, release their droppings and fall down in there as a source of nitrogen and other nutrients. Sometimes insects or small animals will fall in there and die and decay, and the plant gets nourishment in that way as well. Bromeliads make wonderful house plants. They're not only grown a lot here in the United States, but they're extremely popular in Europe and Japan. Now here in Oklahoma, we can grow them as house plants, but we can also put them outside in the summer months to give us some color in our landscapes because they thrive in our summer heat. Well, just taking a look at some of these bromeliads, right here we've got a cryptanthus or an earth star. Now this is a little terrestrial bromeliad from Brazil, and it's called Earth Star because they sort of look like stars kind of plastered to the face of the Earth. They don't have really tall flowering stalks. In fact, the word cryptanthus means hidden flowers, so those flowers are going to be tiny little white things that just barely emerge out of the center of the plant. 
the earth stars or cryptanthus make wonderful additions to terrariums. Well right here we have a Guzmania. This is a bromeliad that also goes by the name of Scarlet Star and you can see the flowering structure or stalk coming up here but the bulk of the color is not from flowers it's actually from bracts. These bright colored red leaf-like things are actually the bracts of this Guzmania. These also come in colors of orange, pinks, and yellows. Now if you think about our poinsettias at Christmas time, it also has the bulk of its color from bracts rather than flowers. You can see some of the little flower buds being to kind of peek out down inside there. The Guzmanias are from Ecuador and Colombia and they really don't like hard water or water that has a lot of dissolved salts so it's best to water these with maybe some bought purified water. Some colorful foliage plants or foliage bromeliads are these neoregilias. We've got this one here with the wonderful white and green variegation. We've got another neoregilia right here with some more variegation with green on the outer portion of the leaf. These don't have just really showy flowers. They don't have a stalk that comes up out of the center. You can see the little lavender colored flower emerging from the center of this one. Now an interesting thing about these plants is that when they get ready to bloom and during their flowering period they develop this red coloration on the interior of the plant. It's very showy. If you wanted to use these out in your landscape in the summertime be wise to give them a little bit of shade. Then in the fall you could repot them and bring them indoors for the winter. Well, the third group of bromeliads I want to show you here are a group called the Varesias. We've got one right here. We've got a small one right here with this little red flowering structure and uh, actual yellow flowers. And we've got this one right over here. This one's known as the Flaming Sword. And it's got this large flattened inflorescence coming up here. And uh, this will give us a lot of color for an extended amount of time and we'll also have small flowers sort of poking out in these little sections of bracts. The uh, banding on the foliage of the flaming sword is, uh, I think, also very, very attractive. These other Vresias are known as the lobster claw Vresias, also sometimes go by the name of painted feather. And these are epiphytic bromeliads. These are the bromeliads that grow up in the the tops of the trees but you see that they are planted in soil and this is because they do adapt to a terrestrial growth habit. So we can either grow these in a light well-drained potting soil or we could wire them to maybe a large piece of bark or maybe a piece of driftwood or something like that. But they do adapt well to a terrestrial growth habit. The Vresias, I want to point out, are the most hybridized type of bromeliad. Right over here we have probably one of the most popular of the flowering bromeliads. This is an Ichmia, or a silver vase or urn plant as it's known. Now this is an epiphytic bromeliad, grows up in the trees, but it also adapts to a terrestrial uh, growth habit. And you can see some of the water down inside there. Now if you have these bromeliads that do have that collection cup in the center. Whenever you're watering the plant, go ahead and put water down inside there. They'll take advantage of it. But the silver vase or the urn plant is truly spectacular. I mean, just look at this flowering structure here with these pink bracts. You can see the little bluish purple flowers emerging from down inside there. This pink structure will last for several months. It gives us color for quite a while in the home or out in the garden. These are epiphytic, they're from Brazil. And another interesting fact about the silver vase plant, the fact that it has the silver color, comes from multitudes of little scales on the leaves. And these scales give it that silver color and they're very important in a number of functions for the plant and they're extremely important in the uh, next group of bromeliads that I want to show you, the Talansias. You can see that this group of bromeliads, they're all, or almost all of these, have that silvery color. And that means they're just completely covered with those little scales. Those little scales 
protect the plant, they keep it from desiccating, from drying out, they uh, keep the plant cool, they reflect heat, they also help absorb moisture. They can pull moisture out of the humid air, out of fog, out of clouds. In fact, these plants are sometimes known as air plants. It's like they don't really need much to live on. There's some evidence that dust particles even get trapped between those small scales and help to feed the plant. But they do have that silvery color. Sometimes we see these plants glued to refrigerator magnets and we just grow them in that way uh, without any any soil at all. Also want to point out that the Spanish moss is a Tillandsia, belongs to that group of bromeliads. But uh, these are a very tough group of bromeliads as well. Some, some of the species of Tillandsias actually grow attached to cacti out in the desert. So some of them are very efficient at completely drying out and then whenever moisture is available again taking it up and begin beginning to grow again. If you grow some Tillandsias uh, maybe on your refrigerator or uh, on a piece of bark or something like that where they don't have the soil it is a good idea to periodically come by and give those some misting with some nice mineral free water. Whenever you are growing your bromeliads, it's a good idea to take them outdoors if we're having a rain shower. And that's because they, they love the moisture, the natural rain. That's what they, they get in their, their native habitat and uh, will benefit greatly just taking them out, outdoors and soaking up some of that moisture from our rain showers. Sometimes our flowering bromeliads are a little bit reluctant to bloom. Now this one doesn't seem to have a problem. We've got a nice inflorescence going here. But if you've had a bromeliad for quite some time and it hasn't bloomed since you've got it, there are a few things you can try to try to coax it into flower. For one thing, make sure it's getting plenty of light. If possible, take it outdoors in the summertime. Another reason that plants may not produce flowers sometimes is because they're overfed. If they're getting too much nitrogen, sometimes all they'll want to do is grow leaves and stems and not produce any flowers. So if you think that might be the problem, just cut back on the amount of fertilizer that you've been giving your plant. Well, another thing we can try to get our bromeliads to flower is to treat them with a natural plant hormone, ethylene. And we can do that with some ripe apples. All we need is a large clear plastic bag or one that's nearly clear and we'll just put, put in the ripe apples into the bag. Take our stubborn bromeliad that's not wanting to flower and we put that inside and then we, we seal that plastic bag up. We seal it up or tie it up and leave it for about seven to ten days and as those apples continue to ripen they'll release ethylene and this will sometimes induce the bromeliad into flowering. Now you may have more success doing this if you try it at a time of the year when our days are shorter. Maybe late fall, during the winter, or early in the spring.